Now I'm going to do something a little unusual, and that is to use the same text I used this morning. However, I won't read it all again, but I'm going to use it in a little different way. This morning we were talking about the zeal that our Lord manifested when he cleansed the temple, as recorded in John, the second chapter. This evening, I'd like to notice some other aspects of that text, which we did not really touch upon this morning. I've entitled my message this evening, Cleansing the Temple. In looking at what our Lord did in going into the temple of God, casting out the animals that were being sold there, turning over the tables of the money changers, and telling the people not to make of God's house a house of merchandise, we stressed, of course, this morning the fact of his zeal, his indignation, actually, at seeing God's holy temple so desecrated and so used or abused, I guess we would have to say. The temple of God is a very interesting subject in the scripture, st starting, of course, with the time of Solomon, even further back. For it was David, you will remember, who desired to build a temple for God and for his ark, for the things of his worship, for his priesthood to serve in. And David, as you know, was not permitted to do so because, as the scripture says, he was a man of war. But God said that his son, David's son, would be a man of peace. In fact, Solomon's name is related to the Hebrew word shalom. In Hebrew, it's shalomo. Solomon is so pronounced in Hebrew, which you can tell is much closer to the Hebrew word shalom or peace than our English word. He, uh, Solomon was indeed a man of peace. The, God, the, the Lord gave him peace about all around, <clears throat> and it was given to Solomon to build a temple, probably, or, <clears throat> excuse me, probably around 950 B.C. We have been told by <clears throat> Jewish tradition that that was a very beautiful, a very imposing building. And that building lasted till about 586 B.C approximately 400 years. And then it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies. When they came down, invaded Judah, took away the people captive, exiled to Babylon, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple. The Jews, we read in one of the Psalms, sat down in Babylon and wept when they remembered Jerusalem, when they remembered their temple and the worship which they could no longer have in their beautiful temple. Jewish history tells us that it was during the Babylonian exile that the synagogues first became popular as places of gathering and worship to read the law, to exhort one another, in the faith of Moses, as it was called, or the Mosaic faith or law. And it was at this time that Judaism, as it later was called, really developed, but without its temple. Following the return, the Jews again began to rebuild, began to rebuild their city of Jerusalem. They also rebuilt their temple gradually. The second temple is thought to have been begun around 516 B.C. and to have lasted in its original form till about the year 20 B.C. when Herod began enlarging it and beautifying it. And that temple was the one that the Jews said to Jesus, 40 and 6 years has this uh, temple been building in building 
And will you destroy it in three days? Or will you raise it up in three days? Of course, they were talking about the time when Herod had begun rebuilding it and down to the day when Jesus said those words. That temple, Herod's temple, which really was a continuation of the second temple, the one started after the return from exile, was destroyed, as you know, in the year 70, A.D. 70, when the Roman armies came down and obliterated it. Jesus said they would leave not one stone upon another, and so it was. Josephus tells us that when the fires were set in the temple by the Roman armies, that the gold that had been used to decorate and ornament the temple melted and flowed down among the stones. And the Roman soldiers, in their greed for the gold, left not one stone upon another. And so the prophecy was fulfilled that Jesus had uttered 40 years earlier in the Olivet Discourse. As we looked at the account this morning, we noticed that this temple, which had been established to be a house of prayer, not only a house of prayer for the Jews, but a house of prayer for all nations, actually. Even the Gentiles had a court in the temple, in Herod's temple. The outer court was called the court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles were allowed to enter that court and pray to the God of Israel, as indeed many of them did. There were many Gentiles during the first century who were tired of idolatry, who recognized that there was no satisfaction in the abominations and the contaminations and pollutions that went on in the heathen worship and had come to recognize that surely there must be only one God who had created all these things and who were attracted by the Jewish faith in one God and who decided that they would go to Jerusalem to pray to that God in Jerusalem. Of course, there was a sign on the door between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women, as it was called, the women of Israel, and only Jewish women could go into that court. And then further in, there was a court of the men. And beyond that, the court of the priests, the inner court, which only the priests could enter. And within that, the Holy of Holies, the holy place, and then the Holy of Holies. So it was divided from the least holy to the most holy. And between the court of the Gentiles and the place where the Jews could go in, there was a sign warning the Gentiles in three languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew or Aramaic, that if any Gentile would pass that point and go beyond, they would be responsible for their own death, which would follow immediately. It was a very dire warning. And by the way, <clears throat> one of those signs has been discovered and uncovered by the archaeologists, which has those words on it warning the people to stay out. And yet the Jews had dared by Jesus' time to make this place a place of merchandise. Originally, that was intended simply to be a convenience for the pilgrims coming there who could not bring their animals from a long way to use as sacrifices. And so a place was set up apparently originally outside the temple precinct. The pilgrims could come and buy their animals there and then use them as sacrifices. Gradually, however, in the competition for the trade, for the purchases of these people, the business was gradually moved closer and closer and finally even inside, which in fact was making the place of God's worship, a very dirty and noisy and unholy and unsanctified place, as you can very well imagine. People haggling over animals and paying out their money and 
all the noises of the animals and all that going on and the dirt and dust and smell and everything else which tended to make the house of God not a place of quiet contemplation and prayer at all but a very noisy and business place place of merchandise a scandal really to the true spiritual worship of God and so as we read this morning in verses 15 and 16 Jesus made a scourge of small cords someone has commented that the description of it here really makes it more a symbolic instrument than an instrument with which he could really hurt anybody it was small strings plated together that would look like a whip but probably wouldn't hurt anybody very much simply a symbol of what he intended to do namely drive out that business which had no place there it has been commented and probably correctly that Jesus indignation and wrath at this point was more likely to have been the real force his blazing eyes to drive these people away from doing this than any instrument that he actually used to do so saying to them take these things hence get them out of here we would say in modern English don't make my father's house a place of merchandise a business place after all of course the Jews <laughs> had a very natural reaction to this in verse 18 they said to him what sign do you show us seeing you are doing these things what right do you have to come in here and upset our business of course the Jewish people because of their exile had learned that the way to survive was to be people of business they were not allowed many times to have farms to have uh, the other means of, of livelihood that the Gentiles had and especially this became true in Europe if you've watched it all the series on television about the heritage of the Jews and perhaps read some of their history you will know that during the Middle Ages and very close to modern times the Jews in Europe were not allowed to have a profession a trade they were not allowed to own property all they could do was barter and trade in money which made them usurers made them bankers and actually made them very rich in many cases in bringing great um, envy against them because of the wealth that they had amassed some of them so they became business people they still are they're very adept at business they've had to be to survive the Gentiles are the ones that made them that way by forbidding them to be farmers or professional people except in a few cases some of them became doctors and very famous physicians at that but these things were often closed to them because the Gentiles would not allow them to have them so the Jews say to Jesus what right do you have to come in here and bother our business what sign do you show that you are authorized to do this and Jesus replied destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up of course they immediately took him to be talking about the temple the building obviously probably logically and yet it's interesting that Jesus mentions this same sign several times excuse me he mentions it in Matthew 12 when he's asked for a sign in 38 in verse 38 of Matthew 12 certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered saying master we would see a sign from thee but he answered and said unto them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given it given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth the same sign actually 
as he had told them back there in the temple, back in the very early days of his ministry. Also in chapter 16 of Matthew, he's asked again for a sign. This time the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, tempting him, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. In verse 4 he says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Again, the reference to the fact that Jesus would be three days dead and then be raised again afterwards. The Jews had been warned back in the Old Testament time by Malachi that their Messiah would come suddenly to his temple. I'd like you to notice that in Malachi 3, in the first three verses. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Here we have a prophecy of the coming of the Lord and also a coming of his messenger. This prophecy in Malachi 3.1 is quoted in Matthew concerning John the Baptist, first of all. The messenger who comes before the face of Jesus to prepare the way before him. And then he says, the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, which Jesus did. First of all, he came to the literal temple of the Jews, and that suddenly. I'm certain that it looked very sudden to them when Jesus comes in, this stranger, and suddenly begins to overturn their tables, drive out the animals, and tell them to get that business out of there. That was a very sudden action on his part. And if you look at John's gospel, <coughs> you will notice that this happened at the very beginning of his ministry, right after he had attended the wedding in Cana of Galilee, which was his first miracle. It was at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And he tells them, this temple I will raise up after three days. Perhaps he even spoke to or pointed to his own body as he did this. We don't know that. Of course, they misunderstood. And they said, are you going to destroy this temple? And are you going to raise it again? Later on, the Jews used this against Jesus. They accused him of saying that he would destroy the temple. You notice he didn't say that. He said, you destroy it, and in three days I will raise it up. It's an imperative. You do it. And that's what they did, actually. They destroyed him by crucifying him for three days. They destroyed his life. They also indirectly destroyed the literal temple when they refused and rejected God's Son that then brought upon them, as we will see later, God's wrath and the Roman armies, the instruments of his wrath. <clears throat> I'd like to look at another very interesting passage with you in Matthew, the 21st chapter. Did you know that Jesus cleansed the temple two times? Not, not once, but twice. Matthew 21 records the second time. 
And it's an interesting comparison with the first time. Matthew 21, 8 through 13. This is on what we call Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. A very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did in the temple, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. Now, now I will grant you that these two incidents seem quite similar. He went into the temple, he threw over the tables, he cast out those who were selling and told them to get those things out of there. But there were some differences also. The things surrounding them were quite different. The first occasion, it was at the beginning of his ministry. This is at the very end of his earthly ministry, right after he had come into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry and had been acclaimed the Messiah, the son of David. Also, the other time he said, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Here he says, you have made God's house which is a house of prayer, you have made it a den of thieves, which is much stronger language indeed. They weren't simply buying and selling, they were actually robbing and cheating the people, which indeed they were, by charging outrageous prices for the merchandise and using it as an opportunity to enrich themselves at the expense of the poor. You've made it a den of thieves. Not simply a business place, but a place where you cheat and steal from others. Later on, just very shortly afterward, Jesus adds to this in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, verses 37 through 39. I'd like you to notice very carefully his words. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Before that he had said, my father's house. Now he calls it your house, implying that that temple was no longer going to be used for God's true worship. It would simply be their house, and it would be a house made desolate or destroyed, which in fact it was. <clears throat> for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Was Jesus a true prophet? History tells us that his words were fulfilled to the letter. That house was left to those people desolate. It was destroyed, and Jerusalem was made a desolation. The Jews have asked many, many times since 70 AD, and they ask it to this very day, why is it that God did not allow us to keep our temple? Why is it that we do not have our priesthood sacrificing in our temple day by day as they once did. 
And you can imagine how delirious they were at the end of the Six Day War when for the first time that Western Wall, which had been called the Wailing Wall, which embodies some of the original foundation stones which once had been buried. They were buried in the days of the Romans. That's why they weren't overturned. They were underground. They were part of the foundation. Why was it, they thought, that God now allows us to have this wall, these few stones that were part of the foundation of our ancient temple, but we don't have the temple? Why are we not allowed to have it? And they asked themselves that. And of course, the answer is in the New Testament, but it's also in the Old Testament. Because they would not accept. Because the one who was despised and rejected of men, it says that they esteemed him not. He was smitten, afflicted. All they need to do is read that chapter in Isaiah and see why it is that their house was left unto them desolate. What application is there in this for, for us living today? I'd like to turn to the book of Ephesians. I believe we will see here some very vital words that tell us the meaning and the purpose for us of these things. He is writing to the church, and he tells the church that we are built, in verse 20, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom he says all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also, you believers, are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We are reading, in other words, that God still has a temple. It's not a temple with stones in Jerusalem. That temple is desolate. It's still gone. It hasn't been rebuilt. But nevertheless, Paul says, God has a dwelling place, and he calls it his temple, and holy temple in the Lord. And he says, it is you who are built together for a habitation of God, a place where God may dwell through the Spirit. God wants to dwell in this age in people, not in a physical building made with hands of men. He wants to dwell in the hearts of his church, of those who believe in his Son, who serve his Son, with sincere and true hearts. And he says that is his temple today. In 1 Corinthians 6, the apostle builds on that idea in verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> he says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body is God's temple, Paul says. God's spirit is dwelling in you if you are God's child, if you are one of his sons or daughters. He builds again on that in 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 14 through 18. He says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he with, that believeth with an infidel or an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye, you Christian believers, are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, 
and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And notice the next verse. And remember, there are no chapter divisions in the original. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Since we have such promises, says Paul, that we, the sons and daughters of the living God, comprise his temple, then he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, the flesh being the old carnal nature, those lusts of that old nature. Put them away, he says, overcome them by God's power dwelling in you. Don't yoke yourselves together with unbelievers. Those associations whereby we are held to them, to their actions, because we're yoked with them. As, an, as two oxen are yoked together, where one goes, so must go the other, because of that bond which unites them. He is pleading for us not to join in those unions with them which would compel us to go along with them as partners with them. And he points out that we then are the temple of the living God since there can be no concord of Christ with Belial and that another name of Satan or the devil. You are not to have a part with them, he says, or with idols, false religions, false doctrines, false teachings which are rampant and rife today in the world. Christ wants us rather to take his yoke upon us. He says, take my yoke upon me, upon you, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Learn of me. That yoke is the good yoke, not the yoke of the unbeliever and of those who are walking in the ways of this world. And so Paul urges us, he entreats us that we, as the temple of God, walk spiritually before the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11, in speaking of the Lord's Supper, he tells us that, in verse 27, that we are to eat and to drink not unworthily. In verse 28, he says, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment, the margin says, to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, notice, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That's a very serious thing. Paul is saying that because some of the Corinthians, through their spiritual laxness, had been careless in this regard, had joined together with idolaters even, had not discerned the difference. He says that the Lord had allowed some of them to become weak and sickly, and some had even died, which is not a very pleasant thought. But he goes on to say, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. This sickness and weakness and even death was brought as a chastening, not as a condemnation unto eternal death. God was seeking to cleanse his people because they were his temple. And so when we think about Jesus cleansing the old Jewish temple, let's remember that that is simply a lesson to us if we will accept it as such, for us to drive out from our own selves, our own life, first of all, those things which may be displeasing to him. Before we may ever look at another and another's life, Jesus said to look at our own life first. Cast the beam out of our own eye, he said, before we look at the speck in someone else's eye. We must consider that. That is not to say that we should not try to help others remove those things, but let's take care of ourselves first, is what Jesus admonishes us to do. 
If we have accepted the gospel of Jesus and we have been baptized into the name of Christ, we have become part of the temple of God, God's church, his dwelling place. He wants us then to be pure and clean from the things of this world. I'd like to notice one more scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. That is not my word. That is the word of an inspired apostle of God. This is God's word. And so it is up to us to think very soberly and carefully about the warnings as well as the blessings and promises that we have found in these verses. So when Jesus was cleansing the temple with such zeal and such indignation, he was also giving us an object lesson to be cleansing our lives from those things which may be displeasing to our Heavenly Father so that he can dwell in us with power and that our lives can reflect something of the glory of him whose house we are, whose habitation we have become through Jesus Christ and through the indwelling spirit of our Heavenly Father.